Good morning to all and welcome to day three of the uh, St. Macrina Center seminar on, on the Incarnation by St. Athanasius. We are grateful and pleased to be led this week by David Lohr, co-founder and director of the center. David, please. Good morning. Lovely to see all of you and uh, particularly nice to have Ludika Lazar with us today. So this is the third of our considerations of Athanasius's invitation to think about the incarnation, not to think about it historically, that is not to think of it simply as a matter of time, but to think about it in terms of the eternal, both the presence of the kingdom and the fullness of the kingdom. So today we're going to walk into the section of his text on the incarnation, which is titled The Death of Christ and the Resurrection of the Body. This is, a, I think, a particularly, I've struggled a little bit to find the right word for it, but I think it's a little bit of a naughty situation because of our human struggles around mortality, around finitude, around death and alienation, and also around what we really think the resurrection is. Whether we confine the resurrection to what occurred for human salvation 2000 years ago in the rabbi from Nazareth, or whether that has given to us a, it's revealed to us, it's unveiled for us how the resurrection comes to be in our life, perhaps even daily. So these are um, our demanding matters to, to consider. We will do a close reading today of section 21 and section 29. So a few initial remarks. <clears throat> I'm put a little bit more at ease about opening up our considerations today by Athanasius's first remark, how he alerts us to the need to come at the meaning of the resurrection in a variety of ways. Lest he says something be left out of the consideration. So that I think at least gives to me a little bit of leeway as to uh, what one might at least gesture towards around the meaning of the resurrection, the meaning of the death of Jesus Christ. And the central question, of course, is why was his bodily incarnation the way? How is his bodily incarnation, death and resurrection, the way, I am the way, the truth, the life. Where is truth in this? Where is life in it? So, The particular logoi 
and the universality of God's word, the universality of the Logos. They, of course, dance together. And Athanasius begins by saying several things about the significance of this. The first is that our savior, our rescuer, our teacher, our model, our example, our companion, our savior from the beginning created the universe and he created and he recreated the image of the father. The second one is that the incarnation raised up the mortal to the immortal. But I remind you of what we've talked about a little bit before. Mortal, morte, death. Immortal means to no longer have death as the prison to which one understands life. No longer is death the colonizer. No longer is the temporal all that reduces life to itself. The third one, the incarnation restores the human being's worship of the Father. And of course, in that restores the human being's way of seeing one's neighbor as the image of God. Those always come hand in hand, cannot be separated. The worship of God, as some of you know, this word orthodoxa, often we think of that word as speaking about correct belief, but of course, more precisely, it means proper praise. And it is proper praise that is that we are called to <clears throat> in our walk in the world and correct belief is simply a secondary world where at its best holds that in front of us and inclines us towards it so the incarnation restores the human being's worship of the father that is, of the word, of the Logos, attentiveness to the Logos, drawing near to the Logos, and the move away from our many imagined false images of what is ultimate, of, of the gods, moving toward the God above the gods, attending to the word, that is speaking to us and calling us. Fourth, the incarnation walked the roads and valleys, showing forth God's wondrous loving communion for all. When we think of the narratives of the gospel, one of the things that is so compelling is the way in which the rabbi from Nazareth, no matter whom he meets, no matter what the situation is, even from the cross, even in his death throes, is present to those in front of him. And that presence itself is... There is an added revelation. There is an added teaching about to us, a revelation about what it means to be the image of God. And of course, an invitation to reorient ourselves in that. And fifth, the incarnation of necessity took on human, the human body in order to be as we are, 
including, Athanasius says, delivering, and I think this is a precious phrase, his own temple, the body. The body is the temple. Delivering his own body to death, to free us from the bondage of death and call us toward the resurrection. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And in the liturgy of baptism of St. John Chrysostom, and I often wonder how, how much this is heard. The person being baptized is not baptized into the life of Christ. They're baptized into the death of Christ. What does that say? What is being suggested here? I want to I want to make some distinctions as we walk along today and try and see if they're in any way helpful. And I think I want to begin with and I have spoken about this, we've spoken about it a little bit before, that in in the scriptures and in the tradition, death is seen as alienation, as non-being, as stepping out of reality, as ushering in a world of your own making as only seeing life through the prism of your own fear or your own desire, your own passions, your own nostalgia, your own idealizations. That is death. There is a huge difference here. They're not the same in any way to speak about death and to speak about finitude, our creatureliness, and in some sense, mortality. So I, I'd like to help sharpen this distinction by giving you a little poem that I fond, rather fond of that I read many, many years ago by the American poet E. Cummings, which speaks about death and dying. And of course, dying is part of our creaturely condition. It also is a way of speaking about letting go of what we presume to be, or as the Apostle Paul would say, dying to self, or we often say is dying to the world, the way the world does things. So I just want to give you this initially to try and sharpen up our sense of what are we meaning by death and what do we mean by the mortal, the finite? How is time at play in these? How is the eternal present? So here's E. Cummings. Dying is fine. But death? Oh, baby, I wouldn't like death if death were good. For when, instead of stopping to think, you begin to feel of it, dying is miraculous. Why? Because dying is perfectly natural, perfectly 
putting it mildly, lively. But death is strictly scientific and artificial and evil and legal. We thank thee, God Almighty, for dying. Forgive us, O life, the sin of death. Christ's incarnation, his body, was as our incarnation, our body, subject to mortality. Because he was one with the Father, Athanasius says, the indwelling word, the Logos, was not tarnished. Because of this, life is pulled from death. Because the Logos transfigures. that which bears the burden of time. The necessity of the incarnation, he says, so he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the rumor monger, the liar, the one that reduces what appears to be seeks to suck out of it anything more than what appears to be or what we make of it. He might destroy him who has the power of death. That is the devil. For all those who, and this is the key, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong bondage. The fear of death, the fear of finitude, the fear of limitation, the fear of our creaturehood is the power of death. And it is that which reorients our capacity to be present to life as it's given to us. We see that in all those gospel narratives where Jesus Christ meets the woman at the well, Zacchaeus, the blind, the lepers, where he meets the idealizations of his own disciples, their fantasies about what's going on when he stands before Pilate and Pilate's wife says to him, ah, be careful here. Some of you may know it, but in the Orthodox Church calendar, Pilate's wife is a saint because she apprehended, she recognized. So, when we talk about the fear of death, it seems to me that this is a way of speaking about a kind of confusion that arises within us, where we confuse our mortality, our finitude. We confuse it. We don't see it as part and parcel of the image of God. And because of fear, we lose touch with the living word, the Logos, the living word that triumphs over death. So let's 
consider our first reading section 21. Let me, it is um, on page 95 of this edition. Sylvie, do you have this edition? <laughs> um, Andrew, would you, are you, are you free to read it? Be glad to. 2190, page 95. Indeed, with the common savior, all, pardon me, indeed, with the common savior of all dying for us, we, the faithful in Christ, no longer die by death as before, according to the threat of the law, for such condemnation has ceased. But with corruption ceasing and being destroyed by the grace of the resurrection, henceforth, according to the mortality of the body, we are dissolved only for the time which God has set for each, that we may be able to attain a better resurrection, as St. Paul says in Hebrews. For as, seeds for as seeds sown in the ground, we do not perish when we are dissolved, but as sown, we shall rise again, death having been destroyed by the grace of the Savior. For this reason, the blessed Paul, who became a guarantor of the resurrection of all, said, and this is quoting from his epistle, first epistle to the Corinthians, for the corruptible must put on incorruptibility, and the mortal must put on immortality. And when the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the word that has been written that has been written. Death has been swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Why then, one might ask, if it were necessary for him to deliver the body to death on behalf of all, did he not lay it aside privately as a human being, instead of going so far as to be crucified? For it would have been more fitting, it would have been more fitting for him to have laid his body aside honorably than to endure such a death with ignominy. Considering again whether such an objection is not human, whereas what was done by the Savior is truly divine and worthy of his divinity for many reasons. First, because the death which befalls human beings comes to them according to the weakness of their own nature, for not being able to remain for, so, for long, in time they are dissolved. For this reason, also diseases come upon them, and, weakening, they die. But the Lord is not weak, but the power of God, and the word of God, and himself, life. If, then, it was in some private place that he laid his body upon a bed in the manner of human beings, it would have been supposed that he also suffered this through the weakness of nature, and because he had nothing more than other humans. But since he was life and word of God, and because death on behalf of all had to take place, therefore, on the one hand, as being life and power, he strengthened the body in him. And as, on the other hand, death had to occur, he took the occasion, provided it not from himself but from others, to complete the sacrifice. For it was neither fitting for the Lord to be ill, he who healed the illnesses of others, nor again for the body to be weakened, in which he strengthened the weaknesses of others. Why then did he not prevent death, just as he did illness? Because it was for this that he had the body, and it was unfitting to prevent it, lest the resurrection should also be hindered. Moreover, it was again unfitting for illness to precede death, lest it be thought a weakness of him who is in the body. Did he not then hunger? Yes, he hungered because of the poverty of the body. 
but he did not perish of starvation because of the Lord wearing it. Therefore, if he died for the ransom of all, yet he saw not corruption. For he rose whole, since the body belonged to none other but life itself. <clears throat> So the incarnation offers to us the grace of resurrection, the grace of resurrection. That is the healing mission of the incarnation takes on human finitude, takes on human glory and weakness. takes on mortal decline. The sacrifice that's spoken of, and you will recall we talked about this a little bit, sacrifice means to make sacred again, to make whole again. The sacrifice of life, the word of God, <clears throat> on our behalf. reveals to us that the body, our incarnation, belonged also to none other but life itself, belongs to none other than the word, which both brought it into being, made us, which dwells within us and which recreates us and restores us. When the great scholar Yaroslav Pelikan died, I had spoken to him a month earlier or so, but he was in the Gethsemane period, his family had gathered with him in his home. And uh, he has several children. And like all families, there are struggles and there are things that are, that happen in, in the lives of families. But it's a wonderful thing when they gather. And I'm told by Father John Erickson, who was Pelican's godfather when Pelican entered the Orthodox Church, and he was present. And he told me that Yaroslav's last words were if there is no resurrection, nothing else matters. If there is resurrection, nothing else matters. This is a gesture toward what matters beyond mortality. It is a gesture, it seems to me, toward attending to what is coming to greet us in all those moments in life when we are faced with finitude, with limitation. It is a revelation to us to not presume about it. Do not reduce 
what is in front of you to what appears. It is the hope that the word, the Logos, holds mortality in its hands, holds finitude in its hands. That surely is part of the meaning of resurrection. At least it seems to me. As Athanasius said at the beginning, there are many things going on here. Let's be careful not to miss any of them. Should Christ not have preserved his own body altogether immortal? Should he not have fled from the death others were imposing upon him? The alienation that others were bringing about? He accepted that death coming from other human beings. He accepted it in order to destroy it, Athanasius says. I would prefer to say in order to redeem those people who were bringing death, in order to help them see that this kind of fear has removed you from the very presence of life itself. He accepted it in order to destroy that fear So I think this is one of the spiritual lessons we have here. Does it reveal to us a stance that we are also called toward in the face of all death dealing that we experience in our life? Is it revealing something to us? about what our capacity is as the image of God in the face of the death dealing that we may experience from the outside. But of course, we also experience death dealing from inside, from our own passions. So Christ's death, Christ's dying, is intimately incarnate in the resurrection. His showing that the removal of corruption, that resurrection is in store for all, is a gift at the very heart of creation for all. That love including the love for those who imagine themselves as perpetrators, offers what is beyond appearances. Life is greater than the end of our mortal life. And death for others, as we see in Christ's ignominious death, as a thief, a seditionist, strung up between the earth and the heavens in the most cruel kind of punishment the Romans could come up with. Christ's death transfigures mortality, ends corruption, The corruption, the corruption that I think Cummings is speaking about when he compares death and dying. 
Christ does not pass on the pain, does not reaffirm the problem. Is that not also a call to us to do likewise? To not pass on the pain, to not assume appearances are reality. So the central unveiling of the passion of the incarnation is that death, dying, precedes resurrection. It is in the nature of things. It must take place. Dying mortality finitude, limitation, is something we have to take on. Take up your cross and follow me. In, in some way, this is an affirmation of mortality, of finitude, of limitation. The word of God does not shy away from all that arises in human life, including dying, including the perpetrations of death. As with Christ, so with us. Death is given in our existential encounters. taking on of death given by others, as we see in the passion narrative, was complete, it was thorough, and it was public. It was not simply a divine trick, as some of the Gnostics would see it, or as some wings of Islam have picked up on those traditions and although it's not there in the Quran or in central Islamic teaching, it is a common sort of folk teaching that we see in that part of the world. It reveals how the word takes death, the perpetration of death into itself without fear, without presumption, without fighting back, without reacting. It is in a sense a response. The word, the Logos, pulls life from death even the death of the cross, it also pulls life from mortality, from finitude. It affirms that which is greater than dying, greater than death. It affirms that what appears to be corrupting is not ultimate. The Logos transforms, transfigures even what appears to be corrupting. It calls us it calls us beyond all appearances to not presume that what we see is all that is. So, what do you hear in this particular text? What arises for you? What 
you want to explore a little bit or think about out loud or bring to the table. Is there, is there several things in it that you'd like to ponder? I um, was a chap. I was a chaplain at the <clears throat> regional hospital here for four years, and uh, so I spent a lot of time in palliative care and in and out of uh, ICU. Um, and then uh, in April, I participated in a evening seminar on made medical assisted in dying with two uh, friends of mine who are doctors in the city. And uh, I just <laughs> found this section so compelling um, because made is now on the medical menu. And uh, there's not a soul that will not be <laughs> touched by the decision to uh, take it as an option and uh, to include the Christian community. And it just strikes me how relevant this, um, um, this <laughs> sort of statement of the obvious that death and dying precede resurrection. It's part of the package. And um, we neither have to fear death or the process of dying and um, in Christ. So anyway, I was just, uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, but it's Athanasius's words and um, yours, David, are painfully <laughs> contemporary uh, as to what the church has to embody um, in itself and how they die and how they understand uh, death and obviously the resurrection. And uh, so thank you. <laughs> it was good to immerse myself in it. Well, I think... <clears throat> I think that um, we spoke about made as on the menu. I mean, one of the things that does really highlight is um, it means that sort of serious questions about the meaning of life are present in dying. And um, now in our country, that has become sort of formal and legal. What's curious about, you know, I've done a little bit of work on MAID and done some reflections with people on it. And it's a, anytime you're in the presence of anybody who is dying or where, where death is knocking at the door, I mean, we need to take our shoes off. It's a very precious mm -hmm. and a remarkable mm -hmm. mystery. So it's, it's, it's dangerous to, I think, presume either way about it as a kind of act but it does surface a number of things. And a lot of them have to do with this matter of presuming about our life and about suffering and our disposition in the face of it. Just want to say a couple, just maybe a couple things about it. Um, because it's such a contemporary challenge
in one of the seminars that uh, I did on MAID with healthcare workers, uh, a doctor stood up and spoke about how he'd gone. He'd studied medicine for 10 years. And that there wasn't five minutes in that 10 years that was a reflection or consideration uh, about the questions of the meaning of life. And he said, why am I the one who is supposed to administer aid? This is not a medical procedure. This is, he said very forcefully, this is about the meaning of your life and your relationships. And I am in no position as a doctor, as a human being, it's different, but as a doctor to, to speak about that. So in some sense, when we reflect on dying, or when we're in the presence of somebody dying, we are in Gethsemane. This is Gethsemane. And when you're in Gethsemane, what are you asked to do? What does the Logos ask us to do in Gethsemane? And Jesus Christ took his beloved disciples across the river Credon. And he said to them, sit here. I will withdraw. I have a struggle. I have a struggle. But please stay awake. Stay awake. And you know the narrative. If there is some way, this cup can pass from me. This is another part of the revelation we see in Jesus Christ of the human condition, of human consciousness, of the human mind. If there is some way this can pass from me, please, please. What is asked of us, it seems to me, in that narrative is to be awake, to be in solidarity, to draw near, but also realize this is not a battle that I need to make something out of. I need to be near, close to, attend. But this is a struggle. in the life of another human being. And the word, the Logos, is at play in that struggle. So I'm, I'm glad you raised this, Bob, because it would be fruitful, I would think, to certainly with the whole of Athanasius's consideration on the incarnation, but with this particular section, to bring it into dialogue with what happens when we consider what our uh, stance is in the face of this. So my own sense is that The only part of it that I have any confidence in is what I mentioned about what Jesus says to the disciples, to be attentive, mm -hmm. to be nearby, to not presume, to sit with the struggle mm -hmm. and um, to be present. Pretty Thanks much it. <laughs> and we have uh, others who want to pull forth a portion of this passage and ponder it a little bit more? Well, not so much that particular passage, but I've 
sat by the bedside of three people who were a chosen maid for the menu. And while they went through the procedure, all of them were in extreme pain that couldn't respond to any kind of um, medication or pain because the hepatic digestive system had shut down. And uh, one of them was actually in so much pain that he was screaming in pain. And I was, so I sat by the bedside and held his hand while they went through the uh, uh, three people all together. And uh, I tried to hold their hand while they went through the procedure, but all I could do was to be present and to be awake and sit by them and pray with them while they underwent it. But uh, it's, it's, it's a situation where it's difficult to try to make any kind of moral judgment unless you're a radical moralist. Because uh, when people have reached a point where there's absolutely no way to contain or ameliorate their pain, and they're just going to do nothing but suffer in horrid pain to death, like burning to death or something, uh, when they're lying there in the bed feeling like they were on fire, uh, you can't make a moral judgment about it. All you can do is be with them and be present at the time. But uh, it's, it's at a time when, of course, life doesn't mean anything anymore because all you have is agonizing pain and you can't think of anything that has to do with life except, oh, God, let this come to an end. And uh, so I just want to say that it's not the sort of thing that lends itself to moral judgments or moral condemnation, unless you're a radical moralist of some kind. And those kind of people are very unsympathetic to life anyway. And moralism, moralism is a heresy when it's a substitute for a life in Christ. And uh, it's uh, also moralism isn't morality. True morality consists far more in how well we care for one another than what kind of behavior we demand of other people. And at a time like that, uh, it's, it's whatever kind of a tragedy is, doesn't it doesn't lend itself to any kind of moral judgment. <laughs> Thanks, Vadika. Um, just one little footnote to that. Of course, in our society, uh, the kind of situation you've described exists, and I appreciate what you said about that. Uh, part of the tragedy of our society, however, is that maid also becomes a kind of instrument which is used uh, because of other kinds of passions that are at work. But that's a, a, a larger matter. So let me return to the, um, the text a little bit. There's one in section 26, Athanasius begins to speak of the revelation of passion, death, and resurrection as a witness to creation, to all creation, to the advent, that is the presence, the um, of how the creator is the spirit moving through all of creation itself. So resurrection speaks to the incorruptibility and the impassibility of the body. He uses this word as trophy, uh, as trophies and the victory over death. So what does this mean for human beings? What does it gesture towards for the faithful? for the human nature's logoi. Let me give you a, another sort of a story that I think helps illuminate this a little bit. In my humble little church, <laughs> There was a, a devout woman, one of the founders of that church, of that local parish, who um, 
I did not know. I mean, I'd met her and saw her, but she certainly looked depressed and troubled. She was older and um, she was a bit bent over and seemed to be angry often. And uh, some years passed and I had a little conversation with one of the priests who told me a little bit about her, I'll call her Olga. And she had been married to a man who was very abusive. And in the Orthodox calendar at this time of the year, between resurrection and ascension, it's customary to go to cemeteries and to pray at the graves of everybody who's gone before us. The prayer is beautiful. The person is named incense, holy water. And the prayer is, may this person, they're named, may David come to a green field, a verdant field. Um, but the whole prayer is about how may our memory, our relationship, may the presence of the person that's gone before us come to green in us. This is a preparation for Pentecost, Green Sunday. Uh, may they come to be fruitful in us. But that's a way of saying, may the prism of death not rule. May we come to see more than that. So this particular woman who had suffered enormously was very pious and would always go to the cemetery, but she always wanted the priest to go just with her, not collectively with the rest of the community because of her pain. And the priest would do this, he was pastoral. He would pray, he would incense, he would speak the name of the husband who lay there. And, um, and after he was finished, she would thank him and as they turned to walk away, she would turn around and she would spit on his grave. And then they would go for coffee and she would go again and again over just how awful he had been to her. This was the reign of death in life. This went on for 13 years. She came to confession regularly. It was always the same. It was always a confession that said, I know that I shouldn't feel this way, but I hate him. And then the 13th year, they went and he began the prayer. May Ehor come to a verdant field. She collapsed on the grave, sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. When he had finished, he just bent down and held her Finally, she was able to get up. And finally, she said to him, now I know where I am in it all. I forgive him. And that was the first time they had coffee in joy. I mention it only to say that The victory over death, over the prism of death, over what has been dealt, sometimes takes a long time. But when the healing comes, it makes all life new. From then on, she walked into the church with a straight back. But why three days in the grave, three days in death? First, Athanasius says that death is complete. It's not a fiction, as suggested in some Gnostic interpretations. It also, of course, bears the echo of Jesus' teaching to the disciples, of Jesus hinted at the temple will be rebuilt in three days. That is, the place of the presence will return, will resurrect. The place of the presence will return.
time exists, makes its demands, but it is transfigured. It may be transfigured. So the son of God himself, Athanasius says, after an interval of three days, showed theophany, the body which had been dead as immortal and incorruptible. And it was demonstrated to all that the body died, not by the weakness, he says, of the nature of the indwelling word, but in order that death might be destroyed in and through the power of the Savior. Death versus finitude, mortality. The word and finitude, the eternal and time, the incarnation and the fullness of the presence of the kingdom here and now. He goes on to speak about the weakness of death. What is he suggesting? He says, and the proof of this is that human beings before believing in Christ, view death as fearsome and are terrified by it. And the proof of this, if I remind you what I suggested the other day, proof here is not an argument. Rather, proof in this sense is what unfolds when yeast and flour are needed to prepare the bread and when it rests in a warm place under a cloth so that it may rise and come to its fullness again? In the Coptic church in Calgary, they built a new huge church in Calgary. And when I visited it, I was so taken by the fact I saw a room and this room had a title on it. It said Bethlehem. And I said, what is in there? And they opened the door. It is where they make the bread of communion, the yeast rising, the bread that's the body. The proof is in the coming of life. Athanasius says that one who has put on the faith of the cross scorns everything according to nature, that is according to our own presumptions about it, the way we recreate the world, and is not afraid of mortality, of finitude, because of Christ. One who has put on the faith of the cross. That is not to believe in the cross, not to have the cross as some kind of doctrine of atonement, but the faith of the cross. Faith, of course, is a disposition of the mind. One who has that disposition, which sees the cross as the tree of life. You know, we, in the iconographic tradition of the Christian East, there is a teaching, it's a sort of folk tradition, I suppose, but that the crucifixion on Golgotha is on the burial place of Adam and Eve and the skull and the bones that we now use to 
mark poisons, interestingly enough, that you often see the cross going into the hill and underneath you see the skull and crossbones. The tradition is this is the bones of Adam and Eve. And that um, the blood of Christ pours onto the bones of Adam and Eve. This is the church's way of teaching and even picked up in a kind of folk tradition that Christ passion, his life, his passion, his death, his resurrection are all about the healing of the human nature and calling the human nature forth from death, forth from the fear of death, forth from collapsing the meaning of the Logos into what is temporal, into appearances. So the faith of the cross is the disposition towards those also who deal death. That what they deal is bound to a surface passion. And as Maximus develops, that well-being and eternal well-being frees one from seeing the immediate concern as ultimate and calls one to a transfiguration of all, seeing all from a transfigured perspective. Athanasius then speaks of martyrs, and we have to remember when he's speaking about this, he's really talking about his family and his community, because martyrdom, you know, if you were in the Coptic community in Egypt these days or in Syria, this would be visceral to you, visceral. It was visceral to, to Athanasius. He speaks about them as, as the witnesses that well demanded, well being required to worship an imperial power as ultimate and required to accept the arena if they're not willing to burn incense to the emperor. He speaks about them as willing to go into the arena, as not resisting. As you may know, the early church, one of its earliest gatherings of bishops was around this matter because there were people who were thinking that mainly young men that if they could get martyred, that would be beautiful. It would mean they would go to paradise. But that isn't the point here. The point here is not to be anxious to be killed for your faith. The point here is to bear witness to the limited significance of death dealing, to bear witness to that word, which is beyond all idolatries. And in that, death is defeated. That is the reign of death, the assumption that death is it is defeated seeing the life through the prism of death is set aside. Fear is the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is fear. That's what hamstrings our capacity for presence. Fear prevents us, removes us from presence so often. It's a loss of nimbleness in the face of what's coming to greet us. So in that sense, one needs in all of life, not simply at the end of life, but in all of life, one prays for the freedom to die. 
for the freedom to let go, for the freedom to not presume, for the freedom to let be, for the freedom to be present to whatever is. So let's move to our second reading, uh, 29, <coughs> section 29. You have this edition, Ted, or you have a different edition? I have the online one, so I have the, the same okay. one. And I found it, so I you can read 29 this, if you want to. You have this one? Yeah, this it is. It is the That's yeah the online different. version of the that one, so it should be the same. Yeah. So um, would you read section 29 for us with um not too fast <laughs> some of us are slow i concur <laughs> well the the diction and the grammar needs slowness anyways it's hard to read sometimes uh, let me know if it's the wrong one <laughs> anyways and then i'll i'll give off but i'm pretty sure it's the same one it begins now yep it is by the sign of the cross yep yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, now, if it is by the sign of the cross and by the faith that is in Christ that death is trampled down, then, if judging by truth, it is none other than Christ himself who shows the trophies and victories against death and renders it fully weakened. And if formerly death was strong and therefore fearsome, but is now despised after the sojourn of the savior and after the death and resurrection of his body. Clearly it is by him, the Christ who was raised upon the cross, that death has been destroyed and conquered. For as if after the night, the sun appears and every earthly place is enlightened by it, there is no doubt at all that the sun, spreading its light out everywhere, is also the one chasing away the darkness <laughs> and illuminating everything. So also, with death being despised and trampled down, since the saving manifestation of the Savior in the body and the conclusion of the cross, it is clear that he is the Savior, being revealed in the body, destroying death, and daily displaying the trophies against it in his disciples. I love that. For when one sees human beings who are weak by nature, leaping towards death, neither shrinking from its corruption nor fearing the descent to hell, but with an eager spirit, challenging it, not flinching from torture, but rather for the sake of Christ, preferring instead of this present life, <laughs> zeal for death. Or if one were to watch men and women and young children rushing and leaping towards death on account of their devotion to Christ, who is so silly or who is so incredulous or who is so maimed in mind as to not understand and reason that it is Christ to whom human beings are bearing witness? who provides and grants the victory over death to each, rendering it fully weakened in each of those having his faith and wearing the sign of the cross. For one who sees a snake trampled down, especially if he knows its former ferocity, no longer doubts that it is dead and completely weakened, unless he is perverted in mind 
and does not have even his bodily senses or sound. For who, seeing a lion being played with by children, does not know that it is either dead or has lost all its power? Just as it is possible for the eye to see that these things are true, so when death is played with and despised by those believing in Christ, let no one any longer doubt nor be unbelieving that death has been destroyed by Christ and its corruption dissolved and brought to an end. Thank you. Just a few remarks and then let's think and talk about it together. By him, the Christ who was raised upon the cross, that death has been destroyed and conquered. The cross as trophy. Trophy. The etymological meaning of trophy. When you look at the word in Greek, it means food, nourishment, trophia, food, nourishment. It's related to another Greek word which means to make thrive, to nourish, to rear, to bring about, to make solid, to thicken. So when we speak of the trophy of the cross, we're not talking about, and when we speak of victory, we're not talking about what is normal for us to think of that in our world. We should be speaking about it with reverence with awe, because this is about nourishment. It is about that which brings life out of death. If death has been destroyed and all trampled down, on account of the Lord, Athanasius says, all the more did he trample it down in his own body and destroy it. And then he has this line, Christ is alive, or rather, and I want to know what you think about this, or rather is himself the life the life of the world. He goes on, what kind of end should befall the body once the word has come to be? It was unable not to die since it was mortal and offered to death on behalf of all, for which purpose the Savior has prepared it for himself. But it could not remain dead, because it had become the temple of life, the temple of presence. So it died as mortal, but came again to life because of the life which is in it and the works are a proof arising 
of the resurrection. <clears throat> So what is this saying about, since as this whole work is inviting us to reflect on what incarnation means as a revelation about God, yes, but as I've suggested earlier, I think more necessary for us is to hear it as a revelation about the human being, the second Adam, the son of man, the human nature. What is it saying about that? Is it also saying that we need to be, keep our eye on, be attentive to the word, the logoi, which is our being, that even though we are mortal, we have a body as Christ had a body. Is it saying that we also are a temple of presence, of the presence of God? We'll talk about that if you'd like. And then that the Savior raised up his body and that he is the true son of God, being from him as the Father's own word and wisdom and power. Who in the last time took a body for the salvation of all, and taught the world about the Father, destroying death, granting incorruptibility to all through the promise of the resurrection, raised his own body as first fruits of this and showed it as a trophy, as food, as nourishment, as a thickening over death and its corruption by the sign of the cross. What is resurrection? What is this revealing to us about resurrection in our life, in our mortal life? Is it a revelation about that? Is it teaching us something about that? What are we doing when we make the sign of the cross? When I first started spending time in Orthodox churches and Eastern Rite Catholic churches, and on a few of those occasions in rural areas would be driving with a priest through a winter storm, usually on the wrong side of the highway. <clears throat> and I would see the priest make the sign of the cross at very particular places. If you come across an accident, if you go by a cemetery, if you go by a church, or if you say certain words, what is the sign of the cross doing? It's taking note of the reality that what appears is not all that is? Is that part of what it's doing? That what appears is not finished, but unfolding? Something is unfolding. Is it a kind of gesture toward the oil of gladness that even in sorrow and struggle, life will be born from death? That life, the Logos, 
will have the enduring word. So, I've raised several questions, including this last one about is the revelation of Christ's death and resurrection also a revelation about human experience and our life now? Is there resurrection in our life now? Or is this solely to be thought of as a revelation about a period in time coming to the end of the, the arc of our existence, dying and entering, we pray, the fullness of the kingdom of God. Is it about both? Or other thoughts you may have and considerations you'd like to make. Andrew, did you? I'm glad you uh, you mentioned necessity at the end. Because I was going to, I was going to ask about this question throughout. You know, death was necessary, that kind of thing. But um, that's that's apart from it. I think I'm following in your vein of thought here, David. Uh, just follow and see if there's something here. I think you have yes. Uh, Monday, we talked about the incarnation, and salvation and deification being one as one we've talked about the incarnation as a form of oh, uh, via athanasius as a form of recreation as it were and you just ask now what does the resurrection mean and and we we've been hearing from athanasius and and and, and, and from you this week that these are one they're one thing it's, it's one gift. <clears throat> Early on, and you point to it wonderfully, but throughout the whole work too, scattered throughout, <clears throat> Athanasius talks about the various revelations of Christ. We looked at many of them yesterday. And, before. and then you said earlier, you kind of pose it as a question. There's one path, the way of incarnation and resurrection. So we have various revelations, one path. And then at the beginning of paragraph 21, he's got this um, image, which Christ uses too in the scriptures, of the seed being sown. So the image of one seed being sown. And then just to preface the rest of what I'm going to say, we also know, we have heard from Athanasius and from you, David, there's no idolatry of death. So the last passage we 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 read up, which you you um, framed well, David, but it almost sounds like there was a, a keenness for death. So the second thought <clears throat> related: death and life are not counterparts. For Athanasius, in our tradition, it it's not. There's only life. There's not life because death is not. Or it's not death when life, there's only life. So it's not like that image that Harris Titus gives us of day and night being as one, where one follows the other. So this is necess necessarily coupled with this, and they're understood together. Then, and I'm going to loosely paraphrase you twice here, David. You have said that Athanasius is clarifying a stance in response both to offers of death and to death dealing. But it's a stance 
which gestures towards the, 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 the light of Christ in which everything is vivified. It's not a stance which accepts and extends the shadow of death, operating in terms of death. So it doesn't see life in terms of death, even in terms of vanquishing death. Like that's the point of life to vanquish death. It's there to be vanquished. It's responding in completely different terms to the question. Not in terms of fear or hopelessness or uh, violence or gain saying all of these things which you have clarified for us nicely. Another sort of paraphrase. Christ is enduring his passing through his overcoming of death. He said it's thorough, it's completing, and it's public. It's a response of love and life, not informed by the spirit of destruction. I think often we, we think that we need to put death to death and accept the terms that we that we fantasize about and then see our courage in unflinchingly facing that which we can't get around, but we can get over it because we have an even better example of someone else who got over it. So we'll rush to it, we'll make an idol. You have not spoken in such crude terms, nor did that Athanasius, but that's a temptation, I think, of our minds now, we think. And what, what you're saying, uh, the, the poem you read at the beginning, uh, Cummings, and then that wonderful reflection you gave on dying and our mortality not, well, our mortality being not under the aspect of death, but under the aspect of the gift of life. There's something very important in what, in how you're phrasing or figuring or giving images of death and Athanasius here, which is very different from what is often understood as martyrdom, as you clarify. It's hard for us to think in only one way, one path. We like to think against this. So we like to include negation in our stance. But negation is of death, not of life. I don't know if that adds anything or if you can clarify anything, but, but that's that landscape that you opened up, I think, is immensely rich. And it has to do with resisting the, the, the cast of mind which sees, I mean, you walked us through it, which sees death as the kind of the foe, the main focus, what we have to grapple with. It's it's our end, you know. Oh, it's not like that. We put it down. He's saying, "Be lighthearted. It's over there. It's nothing. Psh, we're here with light." If there's any sense to be made, or just to open it up and to and to offer that as a way into further consideration. Yeah, that's where these words "trophy" and "vanquish." In our mind, they they conjure competition, and in a way, they conjure uh, struggle between. And of course, the whole understanding of Athanasius and and the tradition is that when we say death is vanquished. Christ trampled down death by death and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. What it is saying is that death and corruption, alienation, death, alienation, stepping outside of reality, stepping into a world of our own making. That's not another way of being. That is simply not being. And so when it speaks in the terms of vanquish, and when it speaks in terms of the cross as a trophy, it's saying, feast. Come back into life. Don't let what doesn't have reality 
rule. Let go. Let go. As, as you know, so much of our, the spiritual teaching within uh, the early church and the, the Christian East, and we find it in, in the West as well, is um, that a large part of the human challenge is letting go of those things which don't exist. And I see Jeremy in the center of my screen who spends his days, no doubt, talking with people as a, a therapist around how often it is that the things that come to rule and dominate in our life are nostalgia, idealizations. That is the things that pull us out of the presence are things that, well, I like to call them real illusions. And by real, I only mean we think they're real. You know, we have something that we have inherited uh, through life experience, or we have something that we really treasure about how life ought to be. And neither of those are bad, necessarily. That's not the point. The point is, if they're depriving you of being present, to what is given, you have stepped outside of reality. You've stepped outside of life. So thank you, and Andrew. That was, this is such an important matter when we, when we read the text and we do read these, some of it that can easily sound to us like There is a battle going on. And it's not that there isn't a struggle. We see it in Gethsemane. But the struggle isn't at its root a struggle with opposite, opposites. It's a struggle around how to be present now in the midst of what gives me fear in the midst of what the implications might be. Is that I think that's well that's well followed by that. So when I think of our world and, and much of how religious language works, and at the beginning of this, I think I mentioned that I, I thought that a lot of a lot of us who seek or claim to be Christian, we have a a kind of we have a real inclination towards Gnosticism that a real inclination towards dividing the world, to seeing the world as a battle, seeing um, the struggle of, of good and evil as if these are both real. And um, for Athanasius, for this tradition of understanding The struggle in human life is a struggle around what I call real illusions. The antidote isn't to take sides. The antidote is the renewal of our mind. Seeing what is real, moving, drawing near, drawing back to the presence of the word being 
incarnate. Not imagining a discarnate world in which you then take a position. What's also striking to me about these passages is Athanasius's emphasis again and again on the body. And <clears throat> he does this, of course, because of <clears throat> because of these kind of Gnostic views that were dominant in um, in that period, and because they had seized hold of the church. I mean, my own my own sense is that Gnosticism is kind of a part of natural religion. It has so much to do with how our our mind tends to work, trying to give order to things that are demanding and, and difficult, and so we tend to divide divide them up and see them through the prism of, of struggle. So this emphasis over and over again on the body and then on, on resurrection. And I just draw your attention again to the, the title of this part, the death of Christ and the resurrection of the body. Are both of those also part of our existential experience? Do we experience the death of the image of God in us? And is the resurrection of the body given to us? And I'm not talking about after you die. It seems to me that the whole of the revelation of Jesus Christ is a revelation about uh, our life in the world, our experience. And it is an invitation to incarnation, embodiment, being present. We are, are we also, as he says, or when he speaks at the end here, that the body is a temple. Now, for somebody who's a good Jew, and I think by Athanasius' time, as we'll see tomorrow, uh, there's a, a fair bit of uh, language about Jews and Judaism. But there was a lively understanding here of what the temple was. So just this image of the temple, the body as the temple. That's not a peculiar notion to Christianity. That's something that happens in Judaism. Because once the temple is destroyed, we end up with the holiness code and the rabbinical need to re-understand or understand again the whole meaning of being Israel, the whole meaning of being a holy people and a nation of priests without a temple and indeed without a land. So Part of what Christianity is doing is it experienced this. The apostles experienced the destruction of the temple. So part of what we see unfolding here, I think, is, is related to what happens with our Jewish brothers and sisters around us. So when we hear Christ speak about his body as a temple, we are reminded that the temple is the place of the presence. We're reminded of how only on the highest of holy days, 
on the day of atonement, on the day of atonement, on the day of unity. Only on that day does the high priest with a rope tied around his leg go into the Holy of Holies, which itself, if you think of it on the surface, is empty. It's empty. And on that day, and only on that day, is the name of Adonai spoken. Only on that day. And it's interesting. The place of the presence. There is a, we're familiar with the, the narrative of the Good Samaritan in the Gospels, where Jesus Christ is asked by the lawyers, what is the whole of the God, what is the whole of the law to love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your might, with all your body, with all your strength? And the second is like unto it, and your neighbor as yourself. The Logos is everywhere present. And then they ask, of course, who's my neighbor? And you know the narrative. Turns out the neighbor is the enemy, or at least the other, the Samaritan, the one who can't come to the temple. That was part of the arrangement. No, 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 you're not pure enough. You can't come to the temple. But in the Talmud, the, this account comes from the Talmud as well. The account is that the high priest, so this is interesting, because so much of the Gospels are a midrash, of course. Well, the whole Bible is midrash in my view. But the Gospels are also a midrash on Talmud. So in the Talmudic account, it's the high priest who comes by on that day. Not only on that day, it's the day of atonement. It's the only day of the year where the whole community gathers, where you can be taken in the person of the high priest into the place of presence, into the Holy of Holies. And it's the only day where you hear the name spoken. And in the Talmud, it says, if the high priest on the day of atonement, the most precious of days, is on his way to the temple to hear the name, to speak the name, to be present in the presence and comes across a human being who has died and is abandoned and there is no one to care for them. It is incumbent for him to pollute himself and bury the person with dignity. For as Emmanuel Levinas, who reflects on this, says, in this sense, ethics trumps liturgy. What is it saying? Well, I think it's saying exactly what is said in the gospel narrative. The body is the temple, the place of presence, and you're being present to the place of presence is the presence of the kingdom of God. And there is nothing greater or more than that. It is being present to reality to what is given in front of you and responding, Jesus Christ would say, as my father responds in communing love. I didn't mean to get carried away with that.
There's a, a reason I think that Athanasius uses this image of the body as the temple of presence. And that's exactly what was the problem with Arius and with Arius's teaching. It thought that presence is something that God has and human beings don't because they're mortal. And so Jesus Christ, who was crucified and died, obviously was not mortal. Or obviously was mortal. No, he was a little bit more than human beings, like an angel or something of the sort. But what Athanasius is saying, no. This is a revelation about being human. It is a revelation about the incarnation that's given through creation. Incarnation and creation are one. It's, it is an amazing way of speaking about human dignity and the wonder of being human. So no wonder in the ancient world you had persecutions because this was saying, no, the emperor isn't or the priestly class isn't at the top. The royal priesthood is, which happens to be all human beings because they all are in the image of God. It's an amazing affirmation of human dignity and a call to our capacity to be present even in the face of death dealing and even in the face of mortality. Good to see you, Ted. <laughs> Any final things that you'd like to raise? Thank you, David. That was good. That's awesome.